Hello everyone and welcome back to computer vision lecture series. This is lecture 3 part 4. We are going to continue talking about how we think in terms of frequency domain. In the last part of this lecture, we saw some uh, examples of sampling and uh, one of the problems of sampling called aliasing. And now we are going to continue talking um, about more in terms of uh, frequency domain. So let's go ahead. Um, another way of thinking about frequency is um, uh, when you look at an image, uh, how many different values of uh, different pixels uh, is there and uh, how, to, how, how frequent those values occur. And this gives you an idea of uh, where we are going in this direction. And um, in Fourier domain or in frequency domain, we are basically handling images uh, using frequencies. And what the, uh, we are going to see how what advantages uh, does this analysis bring for images specifically and computer vision in general. We are going to talk about Fourier series, transforms, filtering uh, in this domain as well as deconvolution and one specific example of um, JPEG compression using this uh, frequency analysis. So what is Fourier series? Fourier series is basically a way of representing any univariate function in terms of weighted sum of its sinusoidal waves of different frequencies. Here in this example, the basic bringing building block here you can see is A sin omega t plus B cos omega t. Uh, this is a combination of two different sinusoidal waves with amplitudes A and B and the same frequency omega. Uh, when we have such frequencies, uh, when we add a lot of them, we can uh, represent our uh, univariate function. An example is given on the right hand side. Let's say our target uh, function is this. We start by adding f0 which is a static value, constant value of 1 and then we have one sinusoidal way of fre with frequency f1. We add it to the, uh, to the um, f0 and so it shifts its amplitude from um, minus 1 to 1 to 0 to 2. Similarly, we add another frequency, uh, sinusoidal frequency, a sinusoidal way of frequency f2 and f3 and so on and so forth, such that we are able to approximately generate the target uh, function mentioned here. So um, basically A and B here are the amplitudes or the intensities of these uh, sinusoidal waves and omega or is the uh, frequency value of each of these sinusoidal waves. Uh, a very concrete example or more simpler example of representing a function is this. Here we have a signal g of t. We can represent it, it uh, in a com with a combination of two sinusoidal waves. One with a frequency of f which is this one and another with the frequency of 3f. It's clear that this um, wavelength when repeated three times is having a higher frequency here. And when you combine both of them we are able to generate our uh, original um, um, we are able to represent this function using a combination of these two sinusoidal waves. Um, uh, when we look at the coefficients, um, uh, they are basically the values or the intensity of each and every sinusoidal component. Here, the first component has a value of 1, which is represented by this bar here, whereas uh, the second component with frequency 3f has um, amplitude of 1 by 3, which is represented here. And so this is a coefficient profile of uh, the various intensities each sinusoidal component has for a given um, for representing a given function. Uh, how do we represent a square wave uh, spectra? It is actually very uh, difficult, almost impossible, if I may say, to represent a square wave spectra. Uh, it's not uh, possible to have such a spectra in practice. In practice, we approximate normally and uh, it's difficult to have frequency representation uh, at the sharp edges. So basically uh, at these points, it's difficult to represent these points because the value changes from high to low immediately and there is no time step involved here. And because of that, um, it's not uh, possible to represent or recreate this uh, signal uh, exactly. So we approximate. We approximate by uh, a function which has this uh, varying frequency from 1 to infinity and as you can see the frequency uh, amplitude profile here uh, it drops in values as the frequency increases but this num the number of frequency component present in the square wave spectra are um, 
essentially infinite uh, because the falling edge has multitudes of frequencies with a varied amplitude because of this reason. Um, this is another example, a standard 2D uh, way of representing frequency component um, in an image. Uh, here you see an image with has uh, uh, which changes which has a signal which changes uh, horizontally. Here it has more of those signals, and here it changes um, uh, diagonally. Um, the amplitudes of those frequencies are represent uh, the amplitudes of these frequencies are represented below their uh, all of their respective images. So here we see that. Um, so these images below images are all called Fourier decomposition um, images or amplitude images of the frequency component of each and every image mentioned above. Uh, because the frequency is low, so so this in this um, Fourier decomposition frequency amplitude image basically uh, the center point is zero comma zero. So the lowest frequency is present here, and here. As you can see, the the, the frequency is um, lower than this frequency, and the um, the peaks are very close or uh, near to one another. But as frequency increases, these peaks go start to separate or they start to diverge from one another. And if you rotate this image, you get the rotation of the peaks also in this case. Uh, if the frequencies increase, the peaks will. Um, go away and the distance between them will increase uh, slow, uh, progressively. Uh, here we can see that uh, if, if the frequency uh, rotate, the peaks are also rotated as well. Uh, basically, we can reconstruct our original signal from this frequency uh, decomposition and vice versa. Uh, we can also combine different signals uh, because we uh, because this has additive property the Fourier transforms so frequencies can be combined like images and then we can acquire one from the other here is an example where you combine two different images uh, to get this um, uh, image and uh, in the frequency domain also you can combine and you can convert one from the another basically um, for natural images we, when we see natural images like any uh, image that you take from your normal camera um, this is basic Fourier decomposition profile that it has and uh, in natural Im images we have predominantly uh, lower values of frequency so low frequencies are uh, more in number than higher frequencies uh, this is the normal tendency I don't know if it is how our natural world is constructed or this is how our physical world is that we uh, in the in the Fourier domain, uh, another example would be uh, the basis of um, uh, another example would be um, to show you that uh, when you look at a, any natural image, usually you have structures which has constant values around. For example, here the sky, the building has this uh, constant color, and because of this, there are not many uh, high frequency components. So when you look at a from the perspective of frequencies. You will see that um, most of the frequencies are centered near low frequency regions and higher frequencies have uh, very low values. So what are Fourier bases? So ba uh, Fourier bases are bases of frequency like the bases of vector spaces in linear algebra. Um, you convert from one space to another space uh, when you change base, right? So similarly Fourier transform is nothing but a change of base from time to frequency domain. And uh, basically here vertically in, in this vertical direction um, the change of frequency is on vertical axis whereas in this horizontal direction the, the frequency changes in the horizontal, horizontal directions. And yeah this is how the uh, basis function of uh, Fourier transforms look like. So how do the how are the uh, basis uh, function how do the basis function look like? So a good representation. This is a good representation of a basis function. So let's say you have an yeah, an image and you want to represent it in as a combination of uh, different basis functions. And if you use only one basis function, then this is all you get. Why? Because in one basis function, there is essentially only one frequency. 
however this image has multiple frequencies so therefore if you use only one basis function you cannot really represent this image so slowly and progressively you increase the frequency count, um, um, count or frequency um, numbers so higher the frequency content of your image higher will be the number of basis functions required uh, so here as, as you can see the, in the example the, the first 400 basis functions are able to approximately recreate this uh, image what are Fourier transforms? Fourier transforms can be represented uh, mathematically. Okay, um, in order to represent them mathematically, we are taking uh, uh, help from Euler's formula. Here you can see Euler's from Euler's formula and its corresponding representation in a unit circle. It's e raised to i phi, which is uh, cos phi plus i sine phi. And um, when you, uh, if you want to calculate uh, any point here. It is. It basically represents a combination of cos and sine uh, of this point. Fourier transform is represented using complex numbers. Uh, using this kind of notation, horizontal axis is um, horizontal axis is basically a real component. Vertical uh, axis are imaginary component, as shown in this uh, unit uh, circle. Um, an amplitude is defined in uh, Fourier transform as the square root of real component, uh, square root of the squares, uh, summation of the squares of real component and the imaginary component. And the phase is encoding spatial information, which is in that more or less indirectly. We will look at it how, how it does um, uh, a bit later. Um, it is um, phi tan inverse of imaginary component uh, divided by the real component. So amplitude encodes most of the signal intensity for a particular frequency in a particular signal or an image in our case and phase encodes more or less spatial information indirectly. This is um, um, so amplitude basically will tell you how much of the signal of that particular frequency is present and phase tells you where exactly is that present so if you have uh, multiple uh, if you have multiple frequencies in a given image their interaction or the phases difference will tell you where these frequencies occur so um, let's say, let's take an example when you translate the image when you translate the image basically I, let's say you shift the image from uh, 5 pixels or 10 pixels on the right or to the left for example um, essentially you are not changing any anything in the image except that you are moving the image so the amplitude profile will remain the same however uh, the phase profile will change and it will add one constant value to the phase because for um, because as, as we discussed phase is phase information tells you where the frequency is located in in a rough sense so when you translate the image the phrase uh, also gets shifted Okay, let's see. Let's see an example illustration of uh, amplitude and phase role. How do how they play? The, here is an example. Uh, here is an image of a cheetah, and here is the amplitude profile, frequency amplitude profile in the Fourier domain, as well as phase profile uh, of the cheetah. And here is a zebra. And here are its um, Fourier transform amplitude of. Uh, Fourier amplitude of the Fourier transform of the zebra as well as the uh, phase. Now what we do, we mix the phase and amplitudes across zebra and the cheetah. What 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 do we observe here? Here on the left hand side, we are using zebra's phase and cheetah's amplitude. But when you look at an image here, it's predominantly uh, zebra. Whereas on the right hand side, it's a combination of cheetah's phase and zebra's amplitude. And we can see predominantly that this is a cheetah. So what does this tell you? That uh, the main content of the image is in, is in its phase and not in its uh, amplitude. Or, um, and mainly our eyes catch predominantly the phase information. So our eyes are very good at locating this phase shifts or this phase locations uh, rather than amplitude. So as discussed before, natural images like zebra and cheetah have frequency and uh, amplitude information very similar. What sets them, sets them apart is their phase information. 
and um, natural images usually are heavy in lower frequencies so they have more lower frequency regions and they fall off at higher frequencies so this comes this begs the question like is our natural world or the physical world model like this or this uh, this is how our physical world built it's a very good question and if most of the information is present in the image uh, present in the image is carried in phase and not the amplitude uh, it's not so clear why it is so so this is a very interesting open research area for uh, for researchers so if you are interested about um, knowing how amplitude and phase play roles have um, amplitude and phase have roles in uh, perception of the image this is a very good op open area of research uh, let's look at some of the properties of Fourier transform Fourier transform by virtue of uh, so they, they are uh, they are linear um, linear transform so they hold the property of linearity like for convolutions if you have two signals x of t and b of t if you combine those signals and uh, do a Fourier transform is equivalent to um, uh, individual Fourier trans uh, summation of their individual Fourier transforms and a is a constant value which can be taken outside and this is um, how you represent a linearity or this is how linearity is defined for Fourier transform and they are um, and it is it's a very useful uh, property like in case of convolutions. Uh, another important property is that Fourier transform a, of a real signal is symmetric about the origin. So what do we mean by this? When we saw this um, amplitude and phase information when you look at the origins here at the center Fourier transform seems to be symmetric around this and this is one of the properties of Fourier transform no matter what kind of input image you have natural or otherwise it's always uh, symmetric about the origin and the energy of the signal is the same as the energy of its Fourier transform this is also very interesting so in Fourier domain it's easier to calculate the energy of um, functions or signals and therefore Fourier transforms are really good um, tools for um, analyzing images uh, in frequency domain uh, this is the theorem for um, um, Fourier transform. So, what is what does this Fourier uh, what does this convolution theorem tell us? Fourier transform of the convolution of two functions is the product of their Fourier transforms. This is very important property. Basically, it says convolution in one domain is equivalent to multiplication in another domain. In this case, the two domains are time domain or spatial domain in case of our uh, images and frequency domain. So. If you multiply two images in uh, spatial domain, you can do the same by convolving their uh, Fourier transforms. And if you convolve two images in frequency domain, you just have to multiply them. Multiplication is a less expensive operation than convolution. And because of this property, we can do some analysis, uh, jump to the in, in frequency domain and jump back to the uh, spatial domain. We will see some examples later. Um, let's see one example of what we meant uh, of this theorem, convolution theorem. Um, first application is to see how we can apply filters in frequency domain. So image to frequency domain, right, or the Fourier domain. FFT is a fast Fourier transform, is one of the methods of calculating Fourier transform of digital images. Uh, this is our filter and this is our input image. We do a Fourier transform of our natural image and this is an expected um, magnitude or uh, uh, amplitude profile of this uh, natural image whereas this is a filter. As you can imagine this looks like um, like an edge operator or something and when you do a Fourier analysis you get two different uh, Gaussians here. Uh, Gaussians um, which are separated because of this uh, because there is no information around here. And because in the Fourier domain there is no information around here, when you multiply it here, uh, this information is lost. So the only uh, information that is preserved is around the center of this, uh, uh, both the Gaussian looking um, Gaussian looking um, uh, curves. And when you do an inverse Fourier transform of the multiplication of these two in the Fourier domain, you can get back your original image. However, here uh, we need to adjust some 
um, values a range of the values to make it look uh, better um, what also happens is when you multiply here the lower frequencies basically here they are suppressed and because of that here it's not easy to see those uh, lower frequencies here you can see edges and therefore um, high frequencies are highlighted basically uh, this is another example of how we can use Fourier transforms for low and high pass filtering. This is an input image. It's not a perfect way of doing low pass and high pass filtering, but it's a very good example of how we can use Fourier transform for doing low pass and high pass um, filtering. Because additivity uh, property, because uh, Fourier transforms are linear, so they also hold uh, additivity. So final images can be combined to get the original images back. What do we mean by here? What do we mean by that here? here is a natural image here two of them and these are the um, uh, amplitude profiles here we cut off uh, the higher frequencies and here we cut off the lower frequencies and when we reconstruct this uh, in the spatial domain we get um, an image which has um, lower frequencies all around whereas in this case because we cut off the lower frequencies and only preserve the higher frequencies we get the uh, image with uh, which has a lot of edges basically high frequency values and if we combine these two images we will get back our original image it's a very uh, rough or uh, uh, you know not the best way of doing low and high pass filtering uh, another good example is editing in uh, editing an image in frequency domain and this comes from uh, experience so let's say you have this um, this uh, an image like this and there is a, a sinusoidal wave uh, or a frequency which is um, which is like a noise or which is like a it, it, dis, it is destroying your image so what you do is you convert it into a Fourier domain and you cut off those frequencies which are related to this um, uh, how do you say the uh, the pattern so here you can see that in these regions these two black dots these are the ones which have been removed from uh, these are the low frequencies which are removed from the uh, amplitude profile of the input image and when you do an inverse Fourier transform you get back an original image uh, without those uh, without this frequency it's a very uh, uh, interesting way of uh, editing image in frequency domain so um, the next question that comes to our mind is is convolution invertible because when we saw here uh, we are always talking about jumping into the frequency domain, editing something and coming back to the uh, spatial domain. So the obvious question that comes to mind is can we do, uh, can is, is convolution in, in, invertible? Or if convolution is just multiplication in Fourier domain, isn't deconvolution just division? Sometimes it is true, sometimes it is what it is. For example, a convolution with an identity filter is um, just a multiplication in the Fourier domain. However, there is one case in which uh, the, the filter is a zero filter and therefore you cannot divide it in frequency domain to get back your original image, right? So this is an exceptional case. And what about common filters like Gaussian filters? Can we just uh, undo Gaussian blur by going into the frequency domain? So let's find out by an experiment. Here is an example where of natural image combined, convolved with a Gaussian filter and we get a um, basically a blurred image. Uh, we do a convolution in the um, image domain and, and that's it. In frequency domain, we convert each and every of this, the filter, the, the input image and the output image. Here, sorry, not the output image, the input image and the filter we convert them into Fourier in their respective Fourier domain we do a Fourier transform and we do a pointwise multiplication here to generate an output and we, when we do an inverse Fourier transform we get back the blurred image so is deconvolution that simple let's say if you have a blurred image you do a Fourier transform and uh, you divide it by the Fourier transform of your Gaussian blur and can you get back this image it works if everything is double precision with no noise basically if your input does not uh, this blurred image does not have any noise and you already knew what kind of blurred uh, was um, 
created. So basically you need to know the standard deviation and mean values of your Gaussian kernel which generated this image to recreate the original image exactly as it is. Because what happens is if even if you add a little noise, a random noise of 0 0.001 magnitude which is very low when, um, when you think about realistic conditions because let's say even if you had double a uh, double 14 point precision even if you add this much magnitude when you do the division with the Fourier transform of your uh, Gaussian filter and the four, with the Fourier transform of your uh, uh, blurred image and when you try to reconstruct it by inverse Fourier transform or deconvolution it uh, there, are, there are a lot of artifacts appearing so this suggests that deconvolution is really hard we need really good priors on how the filter might look so in this case we should know exact values of your Gaussian filter the sigma as well as the mean values as well as we need to know that there is no noise added in the output image and then we can reconstruct but in general it is very hard so therefore deconvolution is an active area of research even if you know the filter like in our case uh, it is still hard and requires strong regularization to counteract the noise so in the previous case we added some noise but there are certain methods which we can apply to remove this noise and recreate the original signal without this artifact there are tricks that you can do and if you don't know the filter that is called blind deconversion it becomes really harder than so uh, so uh, deconversion in general is very hard and it's a very active area of research so if you are interested in this again as i said before for uh, the case with uh, why amplitude has more information and phase um, has special information uh, how does this play and why do our eyes perceive more phase information than amplitude information uh, these areas are really interesting areas to work in and very active as well so this comes to uh, this comes so we come to <laughs> sorry we come to a point where we want, we want to uh, discuss compression now what is compre image compression you must have seen that sometimes you have um, a very high uh, uh, resolution digital camera which stores uh, raw, raw images in 4 MP or even 16 M MB or even higher but they can be stored with a few hundred kilobytes without no no noticeable change without losing quality basically how does this happen can you think about it we are going to decode that now Basically, it's um, it's a lossy lossy image compression technique, JPEG encoding, and we are going to talk about um, how J JPEG enco en uh, encoding is done, and we are able to get lower image um, we are get we are able to get higher image compression and lower memory space uh, without losing too much image quality. Um, uh, in case of uh, in, in case of JPEG encoding, we are using DCT transform. DCT transform is another frequency domain transform. It is similar to Fourier transform, except that in DCT is the full form is disc, discrete cosine transform. We only use cosinusoidal waves. In contrast, the Fourier transform use uh, uses a combination of sinusoidal and cosinusoidal waves. As we saw, saw in the beginning, that the basic unit is represented as s a cos omega t plus b sin omega t in case of uh, dct it's just cos omega t um, the dct is a block based uh, transform basically uh, you you have different uh, filter bases here on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis um, and you divide your input image in blocks of 8 cross 8 basically um, the first the first um, block of uh, your DCT is um, it's a DC component. It's, it has a constant value, and after that, you start getting the um, different frequency um, uh, components or frequency bases. Um, here, you uh, divide the image into blocks of eight and eight, and each block here is assigned a DCT uh, coefficient. Uh, you compute this. Uh, across this all uh, it um, DC, uh, DCT um, blocks and you get one coefficient that represents this block so every 8 cross 8 block will be represented by one value and you can store it in um, uh, I mean you can store so this 8 cross 8 block each and every pixel will have some value but you can reduce this value and we will see how to do that 
So what do we do is for each block of input image that is an 8 cross 8 block we find DCT responses. We compute DCT filter responses which can look something like this um, and it can have negative values or positive values uh, depending on uh, uh, the, the DCT coefficients that you use. Now we are going to apply a few tricks. The, um, these responses here are floating point values and floating point values require more memory to store and to convert them so we convert them into integer values and how do we convert them into integer values we use this quantization divisor so quantization as we discussed earlier is a way of representing um, a range of values in a uh, in a fixed bit of memory um, this quantization um, uh, divisors are basically like a lookup table for quant uh, for quantizing uh, the filter responses okay um, we already know that the filter responses for lower frequencies will be higher uh, than the lower frequency uh, than the higher frequency responses because higher frequencies are not so much prevalent in the image as we saw in our natural images and therefore we use a trick here we use for um, lower frequency um, we use more quantized uh, high high value or high quant um, sorry we use lower values for low frequencies and higher values for higher frequencies um, this quantization divisors is a trick that if we use this higher values for quantization factors for uh, higher frequencies then higher frequencies will be compressed to zeros more so let's say here these are the higher frequencies present here and if you divide it by these higher values when you multiply them uh, element wise um, they will be suppressed to zero um, so basically what will happen is at the end you will get some quantized value like this with a lot of higher frequency values uh, suppressed or cut off to zeros and only some of the lower frequencies values um, remaining in integer form uh, why is this why are we using this tick trick to suppress higher frequency we will uh, <clears throat> we'll take a look at uh, at it on the next slide so what basically happens is the dct encoding uh, does is generate those uh, different integer values for lower frequency ranges and we store the quantized value in an r run length encoding fashion as shown in the image so once you get these values you start from here you go in a zigzag fashion and you do a run length encoding and you store these values so for every block of 8 cross 8 uh, having 64 values you are using just some of these values to store so and therefore you are achieving high compression um, high compression doing the DCT transforms um, basically the JPEG compression technique uses YCBCR space. In the color uh, lecture, we saw how YCBCR is fast to compute and it is good for uh, use for TV and video and uh, such uh, such like this. So what the, what do the JPEG compression techniques do is first convert the input image into YCBCR space where the luminosity component is saved and others other components, the CB and CER, the chroma blue, chroma red components are uh, neglected or they are subsampled and this achieves higher compression this is an example here so you are also first you are converting the image into ycbcr space and then you are getting rid of the chroma and chroma chroma, chroma components for the blue and red uh, by some sampling it and therefore you are ach achieving higher compression as compared to the normal uh, compression so what are the steps we saw uh, that are that constitute a JPEG compression. So first is you can convert the um, image to YCBSCR space. Then you subsample the color by a factor of two. This gives you a better compression. And again, then you split the in, uh, image into blocks of eight cross eight. Typically, subtract 128 to center around one so that you have um, um, equal values in the or you you just value basically you shift your uh, image intensity values to zero uh, centered around zero instead of zero to 255 now you have minus 127 to 128 and for each block you compute the dct coefficient you coarsely quantize it using higher quantization values for uh, higher frequencies and lower uh, values for lower frequencies and 
using this trick you are basically uh, comp compressing or uh, cutting off a lot of high frequency components and they will become zero and then you don't have to store it and then you encode it with the run length encoding um, method and and then that's it and decompression basically is just going backward all these steps but when you go back you know that you have lost some information here while you're doing the quantization you have lost some information here when you're doing subsampling and therefore it's not easy to reconstruct the exact image but you can reconstruct the image with uh, with some good quality and when you reconstruct you might get some um, artifacts um, of 8 cross 8 block you can imagine this right um, and yeah basically that's how uh, the jpeg compression looks like and this brings an end to our um, uh, frequency domain analysis uh, i hope you enjoyed it uh, thank you Thank you.